Hey everybody, it's Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And today I'm going to try to answer a question that was posed by a young man named Corey that uh, I received uh, via Twitter. Uh, Corey was watching one of Dr. Tyson's videos and uh, he had a question about the law of conservation of energy and how sure are we that this law actually applies? That energy can't somehow actually be created or destroyed in a chemical or nuclear process? And uh, the answer is, uh, we really don't know, Corey, and I think it's great that you're asking this question uh, because we tend to think of scientific laws as being these rigid, incontrovertible ideas when, in fact, the definition of them is quite different than that. You see, a scientific law is an idea that's been tested over and over and over again so many times that we agree as a community to kind of say, all right, this is pretty much how it works. We're going to keep using this idea until it fails if it ever does. So the law of conservation of energy is one of these and it's actually a great example of the importance of staying vigilant to this particular fallibility that some laws have. Uh, you see the law of conservation of energy and the law of conservation of mass were both conceived in an era during which we didn't have the techniques to measure in detail these kind of changes. So as instrumentation got better and better we were finally able to observe situations in which the law of conservation of energy and the law of conservation of mass, when considered separately, don't really work together. Now, there was a fellow named Einstein who came along and said, let's not consider them individually. Let's put them together. And let's say that you could convert energy, not only between potential and kinetic energy, but also into mass, into matter. So he came up with the formula E equals mc squared. And this actually helped us resolve all of the problems with the original laws of conservation of matter or mass and conservation of energy when considered individually. The idea here is that anytime there's a process, now Dr. Tyson, it sounds like he's talking about chemical processes, but really this is more relevant to nuclear processes. You see, when you take an atom and you unpack the nucleus of that atom into its constituent protons and neutrons, and you consider the mass of all those subatomic particles individually and sum them up, the mass does not equal the mass of the intact atom. There's a difference there and that's called the mass defect. So it would seem that we've disproven the law of conservation of mass. But what we find is that there's also an energy change associated with the formation of that atom. And that the energy change is always directly proportional to the mass change. And furthermore that the proportionality constant is always the speed of light squared. So we took these two laws and combined them into what you would call maybe the law of conservation of, of mass and energy conservation. And that has allowed us to explain everything. Because any time the mass changes and we observe the mass defect, there's always an energy change that is exactly what was predicted by Einstein's energy mass relationship. So we've taken our laws and we've taken our observations and we've recombined them and repackaged them in a way that makes more sense to us. And this is the point that I believe Dr. Tyson is trying to make is that the mass of certain objects will change as we construct and deconstruct them. Now the, the clearest example of this again is nuclear chemistry. The nuclear binding energy is actually fairly large in comparison to any others. So you'll see this couched a lot more often in terms of that as opposed to chemical processes where most of that energy, if not all of that energy, is coming from other places. But it's a valid point nonetheless that the law of conservation of energy fails in these cases and when it does Einstein's energy mass relationship always saves us and therefore the new law until someone disproves it is that energy can also interchange between being mass and energy. So that's it guys that's how it works at least for now but keep questioning and maybe one day you'll be the one to find the situation where that doesn't apply and you'll end up with a law named after yourself. That's all for now, everybody. And Professor Davis, thanks for the question, Corey. Keep questioning those laws. I'll talk to you later.